Hi, Captain Coleman. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day for this interview with me. Thank you for, for putting me on. Sure, of course. Uh, so, uh, as part of my uh, Whiskey Wednesday virtual adventures, something that I like to do is speak to former crew members on board Battleship Wisconsin. And I was able to uh, to get a hold of you, and I again I appreciate you for taking the time to to do this with me. But uh, according to according to my records, you are the pre commissioning executive officer for Battleship Wisconsin in the third commissioning period, right? That's correct. Okay. Nineteen eighty seven. So uh, if you do, if you don't mind, we're going to start. Uh, if I could just get a little background on you, uh, where you're from, of course, and and if you could talk a little bit about your uh, your uh, your time in the Navy, how you got into the Navy, what 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 possessed you to join the Navy, and then uh, what you did prior to getting on board Battleship Wisconsin. Okay. Well, I was born uh, in uh, Wise County, Virginia, uh, to a widowed mother. My father died five months before I was born, and she had two other sons already, and she couldn't find employment there in Wise County, so she moved us when I was about six to Johnson City, Tennessee, where she could find work as a housemate, and that was our life uh, through high school for me. Um, I attended Dillard University in New Orleans uh, on a scholarship and uh, majored in pre-med. Uh, I graduated in 1964 with a degree in biology and secondary education. I uh, taught public school in my wife's hometown of uh, Meridian, Mississippi uh, for one year, and then I joined the Navy through the officer candidate program and commissioned in July 1965. Uh, my first assignment was a, uh, was a destroyer escort. USS Hooper out of San Diego, deployed twice to Vietnam, transferred to, uh, came back and went to department head school, and back to San Diego again to be ops boss on the USS Stoddard, who, by the way, I just received a reunion notice uh, yesterday, uh, a destroyer, World War II just type Prime 1 destroyer, and then I transferred from there to uh, USS Advance, a minesweeper out of Long Beach in uh, April 1970. Uh, I, we deployed to Vietnam, and while there, my commanding officer uh, ruptured a disc in his back, and I became uh, the commanding officer, uh, becoming the first, the youngest, not the first, the youngest African American ever to command a ship. Uh, there were several commanders before me, and several have gone on to make Admiral. But I was the youngest guy. Wow. And uh, following that, I went to teach ship handling at Officer Candidate School in Newport and started my, my waffle between Newport and Norfolk. The Navy kept sitting between the two of them. Uh, after the ship handling job at OCS, I went to... Uh, USS Hawkins out of Norfolk as the executive officer in the mod squad. That was a, a squadron of ships under that, that, that Admiral Zumwalt created, which placed uh, commanding officer, executive officer, and department heads in one rank lower than normal to give them an opportunity to excel, and it was called the mod squad. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we did well. And uh, in that job, I made lieutenant commander. I taught uh, leadership. And um, summer seamanship at the academy until 1978, and went on to back to uh, Newport, Rhode Island, as the commanding officer of USS Dash, a mine sweeper. Um, went to War College senior course after that. I made commander at the very end of my Dash tour, and so I attended War College, and from there. I was, and I'm proud of this, I was the first person to receive orders as a crew member of Wisconsin. Wow. I'm the, I'm the number one plank owner. <laughs> and, and, so we went on to Wisconsin, and I was there from January uh, 87 to August 89. 
and then from there went to command of USS Josephus Daniels and got a cruiser out of a got a missile cruiser out of Norfolk. And that was my and I retired from there in 1992. Okay, that's a quick bow. Uh, following the, the his command tour, I was hired by the uh, tactical training group in in Denmark, uh, Virginia, where I was an umpire. Uh, for one year, and then I was selected to be Human Resource Director at East Tennessee State University here in Johnson City, which is my hometown. And I came back to Tennessee in 94, um, was the Human Resource Director for uh, 11 years, retired from ETSU in, in 2005, and have been, during the time I was at ETSU and since I've been involved in half a dozen or more civic organizations but that's what I do for my upkeep these days and that's where I am wow so that, that's uh, that's quite a background there uh, leading up to uh, Battleship Wisconsin and and uh, that's really neat you're the uh, you're the first uh, you're the first uh, sailor assigned to Battleship Wisconsin in her last commissioning. Yes, yes. So when uh, when when you got that uh, that position for uh, for precom XO on the battleship, what was uh, what was your first thought? Uh, <laughs> how much is this going to be censored? <laughs> well, try try and clean it up for the uh, for the children. Okay. Well. <laughs> When I was at the War College, one of our uh, fellow war gamers was selected as the commission, uh, recommissioning ops boss of the Missouri. Mm -hmm. And I had made the remark that I would happen to give up part of my anatomy to, to go to one of the battleships. And sure enough, I got orders to Wisconsin, and my dear Navy spouse said, do you see that battle you heard out of me? So it was exciting. It really was. So when uh, when you got to when you got to Battleship Wisconsin, uh, I'm assuming it was in Pascagoula at the time when you got there at the shipyard, right? Yes, the ship was. Yes. So the as, as executive officer and uh, and a precom on a World War II vessel that was being modernized for. Uh, for combat in the in the twenty uh, almost coming up on the twenty first century at that point. Yeah. Um, what was it? What was it like? What was uh, what was your day filled with as far as uh, as your workload? Well, I had some uh, excellent uh, support and training. The first thing that the Navy that the viewers allowed me to do was I visited all three of the other battleships. They all were commissioned by then. Iowa, Jersey, and and, and Missouri. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of help and, and information about projects that didn't go so well in their original uh, recommissioning designs and how those problems were corrected and made into something better. So I had those ideas to go with me to the Wisconsin. But the way it really worked for the first, actually first year, uh, I... Uh, I ran the, the pre-commissioning detachment in Norfolk, and we'd get in flights of a group, they call them flights, I don't know why the aviators got in there. <laughs> um, they, we'd get flights of trainees, and we'd put them through all the required trainees, schools, and I've forgotten how many different individual schools that we sent sailors to, but it was like about, I don't know, 13, 13 I want to say 13,000, but that may be included. Wow. Uh, uh, but we sent them to a bunch of schools okay. in Norfolk and around the nation. So I stayed in Norfolk and I visited the ship about every four weeks. The commanding officer hadn't been named until we were in the project till nine, for nine months. Mm. So the Master Chief, uh, which who I was allowed to select, uh, and I ran the show from Norfolk, including transferring officers through and sending them onto the ship. I think the first and most senior officer we sent to the ship was the weapons boss. Okay. And uh, so they ran the overhaul accounting and and taking care of the, the sailors and men 
Uh, we sent a yeoman chief down and, and set up an admin office there. And so we processed the sailors through Norfolk and then onto the ship. And uh, they were living in barracks for a while, and then at one point they moved me on board the ship. I went down for that. So Master Chief and I went down about every four to six weeks for a year. And then I finally transferred to the ship in May of, of 88. Hmm. And the ship was commissioned in October of 88. Wow. So that, that's the way we managed that. Had a great CEO, uh, Jerry Blesch. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he was a, a gift to the ship at the time because he was really, really familiar with, uh, with ship's hearts. Well, he ran a tender himself. Yeah. He had been kept of a tender, and he, he knew quite a bit of, about how to get through overhauls and repairs and all that. He was great for us. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I didn't know that. So it was you and uh, and the Master Chief that was that were, in essence, running the show until Captain Blesch was, uh, was brought on board, and he wasn't even named when you, were, when you first uh, got here, so to speak. No. As soon as he was named, he was, he was nine months into the assignment, and as soon as he was named, he was working in Washington, so I went to see him by court, and we started getting our signals together. Wow. So, so you were uh, you were pulling dual, dual duty, double duty as CO and XO? Well, they would call me. My title was officer in charge of Battleship Wisconsin Detachment, and so I actually had court martial authority and all that. Mm-hmm. And as officer in charge. Didn't have, well, I did have one, too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, but so they gave me command authority. Uh huh. And uh, then when the captain came aboard, of course, he, he took uh, control of everything. And, uh, okay. We Master Chief uh, there in Norfolk uh, because it, he was there first for many of the sailors. Remember, we had lots of young sailors, 1,500 sailors in the crew. Yes. And uh, a lot of them were youngsters, and so having the Master Chief there to indoctrinate them was, I think, one of the best things we did and decided to do. Mm-hmm. He was a great Master Chief and uh, became a great, great friend. Um, and that that worked out well for us. Uh, and we, as I say, we processed the officers through and uh, sent them onto the ships fairly quickly, except for those who had to have long schools. Uh, and it worked out well for us. But I got those kind of hints from the other battleships too. It wasn't my genius that did it. Right, I got you. That, and that, that's that's really cool too because you got so you you knew you know you knew what would work and what wouldn't work uh, as far as bringing a World War Two era battleship back into service. Exactly. Yeah. And we had one one example of. Um, when I visited Missouri, I saw on their prints and in the actuality where they had located the chapel. And it had become an issue with all the things. The chapel was very popular. And uh, so there were groups using it at all times, and the officers really couldn't sleep uh, with the music and everything going on in the chapel. So when I got to Wisconsin, I had the chance that I found that there was a small arms uh, uh, magazine or, you know, weapons storage. Uh, ammunition storage uh, on the second lower deck under turret two, and uh, so I relocated the chapel down there. And it became the, the largest chapel on any ship in the United States Navy, and uh, we and we had supporters from Wisconsin. Oh gosh, did we have support from Wisconsin? Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And so they spent about two hundred thousand dollars outfitting the chapel. It was we had the nicest chapel in the Navy. Wow. It was very popular. Yeah. And they took things from, uh, like they took the old teak off the decks, and mm. the people in Wisconsin took charge of it, and they made and sold, they made the uh, uh, mahogany uh, bricks. Okay. For all the plank owners. So every, piece, every plank owner got a piece of actual wood from the ship. Yes. And then they made some tables, and I have one here that they gifted me, and they were this pedestal table, and uh, they were selling those up there for about $1,300 a piece, 
and wow. raising. They raised over four hundred thousand dollars for the uh, for the cruise welfare fund, and Wisconsin's really, really got into uh, supporting the ship, and and they were just fantastic. That's really nice. Really, really nice. Um, in fact, if you will, yes, uh, I contacted uh, when they got when my orders came through. This is a little sea story you can leave in or take out. Mm. Uh, the first call I got was uh, from a naval reserve lieutenant commander that was on some naval reserve uh, headquarters there in Milwaukee. The, like you know, like we have reserve quarters, reserve stations everywhere. And he called me, and the very first words out of his mouth were, "There will be no problem with your silver." And I didn't know the story, but you know, silver. Every time a ship is commissioned, the Navy has some distinguished organization of a person donate the formal silver for the officer's warden. Mm-hmm. And we eat with sterling silver in all our meals. Uh, well, Wisconsin had, had silver that had been do- donated for the first USS Wisconsin BB-9, and it had been transferred and embellished for Wisconsin's commission. Well, all ships have a service like that for the war room, and um, USS Missouri had one. But when Missouri was decommissioned back in 1957, eight or somewhere in there, they transferred the silver to the governor's uh, mansion in Missouri. Mm-hmm. When they, in the eighties, when they started to recommission the, sh- the ship, they went to the governor of Missouri and asked for the navy silver. And the governor's wife promptly informed them that it was her silver. <laughs> so it belonged in the state house, and it wasn't going anywhere. And there was a big kerfuffle about that. Mm-hmm. And then the navy, of course, finally got their silver back. So the first words from Wisconsin to me were, there's no problem with your silver. We're getting it ready to ship. Wow. So there's a few humorous side stories like that. Yeah, that's really neat. Um, and then, of course, that was all stored in the in the special case that was installed in the wardroom. Wisconsin Knights built that case for us in the wardroom, yes. Okay. Okay. Now, uh... The uh, the 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 officer that um, that came in as the second executive officer during the the third commissioning period, uh, Jerry Schill, Captain Schill, he was telling me about the uh, the one and only screen door in the United States Navy, <laughs> and he attributes it to you. So, can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I was just there at the right time. Uh, apparently. Um there were other ships in the past that had, had screen doors, but this was the only one that anybody in the Navy knew about, and they were, it was scheduled to be, of course, sealed off and uh, a hatch put there or something. Uh-huh. But with the cooperation of the shipyard uh, leadership, uh, I decided that we, that we wanted to keep that screen door, although I never had much time to sit and admire the ocean <laughs> inside of it. But, but it, we had a screen door, and I'd open the hatch and... and, and leave the screen door open and, and we'd, we'd enjoy it. And I was told that was the only one on any combat missile. But uh, I'm not sure, but it's there. Yeah, the, uh, the door, uh, the door, of course, is still there, but the screen has been replaced with plexiglass. Oh, gosh. Yeah, so, there, so we have plexiglass there, and I, I toy with returning the, uh, the screen uh, back into the it's it's uh, it, into the door itself, but the problem is is that the executive officer's uh, stateroom and cabin is um, HVAC controlled, so we have we have air running in there, and so there's air conditioning in the summer and heat in the winter. And if I put that screen back up, then I have to keep the outside door closed uh, to to maintain that boundary, and then it cuts back on people actually going in and seeing your stateroom. Yeah, that's kind of funny. I visited in, uh, let me do some math now. I brought my grandson when he was 12, and that would have been 98, 2002, 98, 08. 
Mm-hmm. Ten, yeah, about, about 2010. He was 12 years old, so I brought him to, to just he and I took a, a, a sneak trip off to Norfolk. Sure. And I didn't tell him where we were going until uh, we were underway. Okay. And so his, one of his greatest delights was going aboard the battleship, and, uh, and they treated us like royalty. Um, mm hmm. He told his grandmother, he says, I thought they'd recognize Grandpa, a Papa, he calls me, but I didn't realize they'd idolize him. So they gave us free run of the ship so we could go in when we wanted. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, my biggest problem all day was going to the door and turning around and telling somebody else that they couldn't follow me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I got off the regular tour and just went anywhere we wanted. Yeah. And uh, I went into my stateroom, which was on the tour. And that was a mistake. I got caught in there, and you could hear people passing the word back down the hallway, hey, the real XO's in here. And so we were trapped in there for about an hour. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> people coming through and wanting to get wanting a picture and wanting to talk. But they were wonderful. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a, a torture. It was just it made a tactical mistake there. Yeah, well, you know, you're, you come on board here, and you're a rock star. I, it's... <laughs> You're a rock star, You're, and and, um, and yet we we still do that today. I still try very much so because when I when I was coming with my family before I started working here, when I was coming and visiting the ship, uh, I was treated by the staff here like a rock star. So I so it's something that I continued. I try to do very 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 hard. I try very hard to uh, to make the former crew members that come and visit us feel like the rock stars that they are and because we, cause we are uh do you still have or did you have a program where uh with res advanced reserves you could sleep on board you yes could sleep on board. we still we still do that we still have our overnight programs on board we give special tours um so we we, we do we do the overnights we give uh guided tours to general general guests when they buy the tickets, and then, like, if you were to come back and visit us again, you would be you would have free reign of the ship. I do that with all uh, all returning veterans uh, of the battleship. Yeah, if, like take you, I take you stuff where where the general public does not go. I'm I'm so proud of that. And one other thing, I'm really grateful for mm -hmm. um, when the ship was moved from the shipyard over to the to water side. Yeah. You, got, you guys sent out invitations to about 1,200 people, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I was one of those, and I was just delighted to be on board. Wow. Um, and another quick little sea story. Yeah. Another guest, another guest, he wasn't a member of the crew, but there had been a, a movie, um, uh, what the heck's the name of it, uh, Men of Honor. Yes. Uh, with Carl Brashear, the, the diver. Yep. And uh, I knew him, and I knew his... his second wife uh, she was an active duty Navy nurse captain when they married and he was of course a, um, a retired Master Chief Tiger uh, uh -huh. injured uh, a disabled vet mm -hmm. but anyway uh, so I knew them and I was I went to see the movie here in Johnson City and I was really upset by the movie and I'll be honest with you Okay. All the, almost all of the things that happened to him he began his career in the Navy had, had happened to me. Wow. And uh, uh, all along the way, so I left the movie, I was really angry. Uh, but then I, I got over it and I got back to work and I was telling people uh, at, around work that uh, they should attend, they should go to this movie. And that I knew the central character in the whole bit. And of course everybody, yeah, 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 you know everybody in the Navy. And so... When I went to Norfolk for the ship to be moved to the pier, Carl Brashear was on board. And so I came back to Johnson City with about three pictures of myself and Carl Brashear, and I said, by the way, you know that guy I told you about? This is he and I. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, you know, I don't know, one of those ego revenges. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> but yeah. So well, that's something I didn't. So you and Carl Brashear were here when the ship came and came and tied up at at Waterside. Yes, sir. Wow, that's really neat. I'll have to ask some of the. Uh, we have we still have some staff here that was here when that happened. I'll have to ask them if they uh, if they remember all that. Yeah, 
regretfully he died a few years later. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. That's something else. But there's just a few little sea stories. Oh, one more. One mm-hmm. more. Well, yes, of course. Who's the oh, Lee? Thing is the Mississippi squirrel. Okay. Thing, singer. Oh gosh! Oh gosh! He's, anyway, uh, Ingalls, I think fiftieth anniversary was before almost the week of our recommissioning. Ingalls did a lot of things on the side uh, for their celebration, but included Wisconsin because she was the biggest thing they had going at the time. Lee, not, not Lee Greenwood. He's the USA guy. Anyway, there's a little slightly built singer and he sings crazy songs and one of them is Mississippi Squirrel. So he was their featured act um, the, the night of Ingalls' celebration. Okay. So anyway, I took he and, and his entourage on a tour of the ship. And the th- thing that was amazing, let me back up and tell you too. Uh, when I had visited the ship the first time with one of my master chiefs, not the command master chief, but another master chief, fire controlman, and we got up to the bell and we had some pictures taken with the bell and I made some comments that uh, uh, it would be really nice if we could renew the bell. It was, I think, I think it was steel. Um, and uh, so they scrapped, they took scrapped pumps and all kinds of bronze materials mm-hmm. and ended up in Wisconsin. And Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Foundries, I think is the name of it, they make the grids and stuff that you see over storm drains in cities. We've got some of them here in Johnson City by Wisconsin Casting Company or whatever it is. Uh-huh. Anyway, they, they made a, they never made a bell, bell before, but they made that bell that you have. Wow. And uh, so they hung it on the ship. So when I took this this uh, musician around the ship, we got up to the bell, and I told him the story of the bell. And he was like, it was just about sundown. He goes, oh, man, that's exciting. He said, uh, can I ring it? I said, go right ahead. <laughs> and he reached up and he rang it once. I said, go ahead and ring the bell. He said, they won't get me in trouble. I said, I'm they. <laughs> <laughs> ring the bell. And he rang that bell about six times. He had to reach up to get the lanyard. Yeah. And he really enjoyed it. And the next day, uh, during his performance, he told that story. <laughs> and, but he also, oh, gosh, what's his name? Uh, he does the uh, "It's Me, Margaret," the obscene color song. Okay. And some some of the people down there will know who he is. Anyway, he changed that. He's got a song that goes, "Hi, Margaret, are you busy?" And he does an obscene call with her. And then they put him in jail, and he's allowed to make one call, and he calls Margaret. It's me again. <laughs> he took that song and changed it to Karen, which is the captain's wife. And he did that during his performance for England for Ingalls' anniversary. Wow, that's neat. <laughs> We've got some stories. <laughs> yeah, that's that's neat. So um, let's see. So you you came you came on board in eighty eight. You left in ninety. Is that right? No, August eighty nine. August of eighty nine. Okay. And then that's when that's then when you went over to the Josephus Daniels as the commanding officer. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so before, just to give you the whole career before I came to Wisconsin, I, I had a strange career. Okay. I did everything the Navy asked me early in Dublin, and then I still didn't make Admiral. But but um, I told you about becoming the, the I was an executive officer at, as a, as a lieutenant. Yep. And uh, then I became commanding officer briefly. We brought the ship back from Vietnam and, and decommissioned it. Um, so that was my first command tour, my first XO tour. Uh, the command tour wasn't legitimately long enough for me to keep the command uh, pen. Okay. So, uh, so then I went as part of the mod squad as XO of a destroyer while a lieutenant. And then I went from there to the academy and then to command of the dash 
as a lieutenant commander. I uh, went to War College and then back to command of USS Miller in, in Rhode Island. And from there to uh, War College again and back to sea as the executive officer of Wisconsin and then CEO of Daniels. So I had three, four three, three XO tours. Wisconsin. Uh-huh. Uh, Hawkins. Yeah. Three XO tours and four command tours as, a, as an African American. I think that is the record, even though there have been guys who made Admiral. They didn't have as many ships on the way up. Okay. Hmm. Well, that's just a moment if you can verify that in any way. Right. Uh, they may say I can't count the first command tour since it was just an abbreviated tour. Um, but that still gives me three and three. Yes. Yeah. And that that's 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 really remarkable too. You you stated you weren't the first African man African American commanding officer, but you were the youngest. Youngest ever, yeah. That's something else. Well, if, unless you go back and check your history now. Yeah. Robert Small Robert Small is after he took the planner out of Charleston. The uh US Navy finally gave it back to him and made him master, so he was only uh, 20 some, 27 some, so he's a year so younger than me. <laughs> you go back that far. Yeah, I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah, because uh, according to according to all the information I've found, you're the only African American sailor or uh, officer that made executive officer on a battleship. That's the best of my history too. Yeah. Yeah, that's some. That's that's quite a quite a remarkable feat. And it, it's. Go ahead. I can put on my list, and I, I have you got time for these sea stories? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to give you a suggestion when we're done. Um, I was I was blessed in the Navy. I, I like I told you, I had heard and seen the little discriminatory issues. Mm-hmm. All of them. I had the nigger notes on my bunk. Uh in my second ship, I think, wasn't in the first. But and I suspect that there is a, there was a conspiracy for my starting. And I'll say this: I had orders to a new guided missile destroyer out of OCS. They give you orders about two weeks in advance, or a little earlier maybe. And I had shipped all my excess baggage and stuff out to that ship. And uh, the day of graduation, a yeoman chased me down. On, actually, on my way to the parking lot. Uh, and told me my orders had been changed. My orders were changed from that guided missile destroyer, which was a new ship, to the destroyer escort Hooper, which was about 13 years old. Smaller ship, smaller wardroom. Um, uh, okay, as long as it's in San Diego, because my clothes are going that way, and they said, yeah, it's in San Diego. So I got there, and I, I had a commanding officer for about two weeks, and I can't tell you his name right now. Mm-hmm. He was relieved. He was relieved after I got shortly after I got there by Lieutenant Commander High Gurney, uh, and he was the greatest thing that ever happened to me in the Navy. Okay. He uh, he trusted me. He taught me. Uh, on one occasion, he reprimanded me. <laughs> <laughs> I chewed a sailor out in front of him one day, and he told me, he "says." That was his displeasure. You could hear him suck the air in his teeth. Okay. That was the only display of displeasure he ever showed. Mm. Cool guy. And uh, he said, I'm going to have to teach you how to how to uh, step on his... Uh, I need to teach you how to step on a sailor's toe without spoiling his shoe shine. Yeah. And now I used that in my leadership class years later at the Naval Camp. What he meant was you had, I had, you had to learn how to discipline the person but don't destroy his, his, his confidence in himself or his appearance or his esteem. Mm-hmm. Greatest lesson in leadership I ever had. Yes. And so I never did like the guy that screamed and yelled and cursed at people. Um, and the very next guy that relieved Gurney was one of those guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I never really understood that that uh, that idea behind leadership in that in that capacity like that. Yelling and screaming and uh, demoralizing doesn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense. So I've experienced one or two of those later on in my career. And um, 
and I ran into uh, a couple of problem issues. You know, if you got time, I'll tell you what my last my my final sea story in the Navy. Yeah, sure. I was uh, I had asked to be assigned. I'd been on continuous six and a half years of sea duty, which is unusual for oh six. And so I, I asked that when I was relieved in May of 1992 to be assigned to some shore command uh, where I could prepare for my retirement and my the uh, uh, the discharge uh, seminar they give you and all that kind of stuff. I wanted some time to take care of myself and my house, and, and I'd been away from home the last eight months uh, of my career. I hadn't had a chance to even do anything at home. So the Navy complied and gave me three months of GAB. Uh, come at um, Airland, uh-huh. uh, the assignment to the aviators. And while there, I had an incident that had repeated itself, it had preceded itself several times over the course of my career with both myself and my family members. But uh, I had a little MGB, and I was going up and down the, the lanes in the Navy Exchange parking lot looking for a space. And I uh, got to a, a van and just on the other side of the van was an empty space. And I was, you know, halfway door to door to the space by the time I could see it. And I stopped and I put on my uh, backup lights and the guy behind me wouldn't move. And he just sat. He just sat. And so finally I squirmed around with my MG and got in the space anyway. Uh-huh. He roared on past the tail of my car and went up to the top of the column. You know how herringbone parking is. Yeah. He turned. He turned and uh, uh, started back down the um, the lane adjacent. And sure enough, about two cars past where I was, pointing north, he found one pointing south. Of course, uh-huh. he got. It. I couldn't see him, but he got in the space. And then he came around, and I remember, mine's a little short MGB. Yeah. He pulls. He pulls around, and he walks across. And he was he was storming right up to my car. Then he just stopped up all of a sudden, and his eyes got big, and he started to walk away. And I got out of the car, and I said, sir, can I help you? And I put my hat on, and so here we stand, two four stripers. And he had looked at my bumper, and I said, is there a problem with uh, my car or something? He said, well, uh, um, uh, I, I guess I just, I just made a mistake. And I said, you certainly did, Captain. I said, I'd like to know your name. And he didn't ask me. I said, I think you're going to tell me your name, or there's going to be two force papers rolling around on this asphalt. I'm going to kick you right in your ass. <laughs> he, he got all red in his face, and he says, uh, uh, my, my name is Captain Swanson, and I, I work for such and such. And I said, okay, thank you very much. I said, I'd hate to be one of your sailors if your, uh, your actions are so obvious just based on somebody's appearance. Yeah. And he wow. didn't have a word to say. Now, here's my last thing. Yes, sir. Right. So I called his XO, or chief of staff, really. He was a captain. And I got the same old stuff that I had gotten at least a half a dozen times over the years. And that was, well, uh, 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 Captain Coleman, I, I'm sorry that you feel that way about it. Uh, uh, he probably just, just made an honest mistake. I said, I asked him if he controlled all the parking spaces in the lot or just the ones that I parked in. Hmm. And uh, uh, obviously he was trying to see if I had, I had parked in one of the reserve for COs and above or whatever. Yeah. And um, the chief staff couldn't see my point at all. So mm. so I just said, well, thank you very much. You might advise him that if he does that again, I will certainly kick him in the ass. Yes. <laughs> and, that was, and then I hung up on the, on the chief staff. Yeah. I didn't have anything to lose at that point. Um, about 18 days from, from retirement. <laughs> Nobody can demote me for that. <laughs> I might put something in my record, but at that point, I don't get there. Right. But that had happened to me more times than one. I had a guy run up to me, same thing at the commissary in Charleston. Hey, hey, you can't park there. <laughs> and I said, I said, uh, what would make you presume? He said, that's reserved for so-and-so. I said, well, what would make you presume that one, that I can't read, and two, that the sign doesn't apply to me. Mm-hmm. And that was one that I had encountered with. There were several. I even asked my 
patrolman in, in the base police in Long Beach actually asked my wife whose car she was driving. Wow. So, so you know, that's, I don't even think about that stuff. No. Had a great, had a great career. And uh, what I've done here in town is, uh, uh, was the human resource director at ETSU, mm-hmm. implemented race relations training for all staff, including medical doctors, while mm-hmm. I was there. We did, I don't say I. Yeah. Uh, my office did. Um, and I served on uh, several, all, all kinds of committees from the uh, American Heart Association to, uh, um, God, this review, review uh, admissions committee for the ETSU Medical School, College of Medicine. Hmm. Uh, uh, I don't know, half a dozen others. And one of my proudest is while I was still at the university, I was selected to be the grand jury foreman for the county. And I enjoyed that for 11 years. Wow. Really enjoyed that. So I've been on two or three other civic committees around here, so we're okay. Bill, if you don't mind me calling you Bill, yeah. one, one of the uh, one of the things that uh, that my viewers are always asking, and I started to do this with all the different crew members that I interview, is what was your general quarter station? Because as a sailor, of course, we have a job, uh, and not all jobs relate to actually fighting the ship. You know, as as a, as a postal clerk. You know, there's no guns down in postal and and that sort of thing. So, so what did, what do you do there? So, my question to you is, as executive officer, what was your general quarter station? Where would you be found should you need to fight the ship or something happened on board the the, the ship? Believe it or not, there is no assigned position. So I was free to roam the ship. And what I did mostly was I I just if we were doing something like the unwrap or something like that, I'd, I'd go monitor those stations and make sure for safety. Uh, the captain never specified what, it, what he wanted me to do, but uh, at general quarters, I would usually gravitate to CIC. CIC? Yes. Okay. It's not what it's called on the battleship. What's it called there? Uh, well, there's there's Combat Information Center down on the third uh, fourth deck, and yeah. then there's Combat Engagement Center up on the O2 level. Yeah, that's where I would go. Okay, Combat Engagement Center. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then where was, uh, where would the captain be? On the bridge. On the bridge. All righty. All righty. So, uh, Bill, thank you very much for for doing this with me today, for uh, for taking the time. Uh, and and I appreciate everything that you've said, and, and uh, the stories are absolutely fantastic. I really do uh, appreciate your time and your service to Battleship Wisconsin and your service to this great country. And uh, I want to thank you. Thank you very much for for helping me out with my uh, Whiskey Wednesday virtual adventure here. Well, I appreciate you and the job you're doing. And if I get an opportunity to come back to Norfolk, I certainly would like to meet you. Oh, yes, sir. And if you got time, time for a 30-second, I'll give you my last sea story. Oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. I stole this idea from another friend of mine. But when I had my change of command, I was standing up there, and I had friends from everywhere. My gosh, they came from everywhere. I looked down. I had about five minutes to go on my speech, and I, I looked down, and I said, well, we've only got about half an hour to go. And you could see everybody squirm. <laughs> Not a half an hour. And, uh, of course, I was lying. And so I ran on through the last four or five minutes, and I said, the longer I keep talking this day, I'm still Captain W.A. Coleman, United States Navy. I said, but when I finish talking this time, I'm just Bill. And I sat down. Wow. So that's what I tell everybody around here, I'm just Bill. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'll be 80 years old in April. In May, are you? There are, there are folks in this town who still know me as Little Bill. <laughs> That's wonderful. And they don't forget to remind me or remind me. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely wonderful. Yeah, I've been blessed. 
Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for the time. You're very welcome, sir. Appreciate you guys. Okay. Okay. Yeah.